Good morning. I would um, like to apologise for having my coat on as I'm recording the sermon today. It's very cold in the building and I've tried it without my cold coat on and I'm basically chattering my teeth. So I um, hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, we're returning this morning to Hebrews chapter 10 and our reading starts from verse 1 through to the end of verse 18. Since the law only has a shadow of the good things to come and not the tr true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices, which are continually offered year after year, make perfect those who approach. Otherwise, they would have ceased their offerings, since the worshippers, cleansed once and for all, would no longer have um, consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there was a reminder of sin year after year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you take no pleasure. Then I said, see God, I have come to do your will, O God. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. When Jesus said these things, you have desi neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, for these are offered in accordance with the law. He then added, see, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And it is by God's will that we've been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Well, every priest stands day after day at his service, service, offering again and again the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he then sat down at the right hand of God. And since then, he has been waiting until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also so testifies to us, um, for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law on their hearts and I will write my law in their minds. And he also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. It's a great passage, Hebrews 10 verses 1 to 18. And we're going to focus on a couple of the things that's been brought to us by the writer of Hebrews today. So let's pray. Father God, as we come to this word, we pray you'd, um, you'd make this the beginning of a much deeper conversation with you where we learned from you about your word and its applicability to our lives, our need for it in these days. Lord, be with us and bless us and keep us, we pray. Amen. So, today in Hebrews chapter 10, we are drawn backwards. We're drawn backwards into the Gospels. We're going to later look at Matthew 9. And we're also going to look at the prophet Hosea, specifically Hosea um, chapter 6. Well, in the beginning of chapter 10 of Hebrews, we're again told of the dismissal of the old covenant and that is good news for us it is good news that what was done um, no longer has any applicability to us and um, to the world it was good news that um, Christ came and replaced the sacrifice of animals because those sacrifices again and again they only tempered the pain of sin they could never overcome it they could never deal with the problem of sin once and for all well it's fitting that Jesus, who Hebrews calls the author and the pioneer of our forgiveness, speaks of the purpose of his coming, of his incarnation. It's fitting that he reminds us that he is going to become our once and for all in chapter 10, verses 5 to 7. And here Hebrews um, quotes Hosea 6. And Hosea 6 is a wonderful scripture, a chapter that begins, first of all, with a prophecy of the victory of Jesus, which we're seeing fulfilled in the words of Hebrews in in Hosea 6, chapter 1, it says this, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us and he will heal us. He has struck us down, but he will bind us up. 
and after two days he will revive us because on the third day he will raise us up that we might live with him. See, resurrection life, resurrection life is only possible through um, Jesus' work on the cross, through Jesus who permanently purchases us by his sacrifice, who permanently purges sin stain from the core of our beings, who cleanses our consciences once and for all. And you know, because of that in Hosea, in chapter six, verse four, we're entreated to an intimate walk with Yahweh. Remember Yahweh, when we see Lord written in capitals, it's a reminder that it's, it's the personal God. It's the God who walks with us, the God that was in the Garden of Eden. And it's the Lord himself who has engraved our names on his hand. And it's, it's the Lord himself who has written our names on his heart by his complete work of the cross. See, Hosea comes to tell us that no matter the challenge, walking with the Lord is our truest and surest hope. He says, look, let us... No, let us press on to know the Lord. Let us do that because his appearing is as sure as the dawn and he will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. See, the Lord comes to refresh and to feed us, to grow us strong as we trust in him. Now the prophet speaks the words of God, where God's voice is heard and God says, what will I do with you, Ephraim? What shall I do with you, Judah? Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. Therefore, I have hewn them apart um, like by the prophets, and I've used the prophets, and I've taken and killed them by the word of my mouth, and my judgment will go forth as light. For what I desire for my people is steadfast love, not sacrifice. What I desire is the knowledge of God, not burnt offerings. See, the, the prophet Hosea knew the struggles of the relationship between a faithful one and an unfaithful one. For the prophet was commanded to marry a prostitute, one who lived a fickle and cheap, self-satisfying life, one who gave herself to other lovers as freely as she desired. And that's the way that Israel had treated God. God had loved them first. God had given them everything, and yet they treated God with, with um, contempt, a fickleness, and they went here and they went there and they went everywhere chasing after other gods. See, when it comes to God and his love for his people, I've said this before, God is not in a complicated um, place of understanding. God loves us. God gave his son um, to save us. Jesus comes into our world, comes into our existence, and he comes, why? Well, he doesn't come to make us happy, brothers and sisters, to those who are listening. Does Jesus doesn't come to make you and I happy. Jesus comes to make us whole. He comes that we might find forgiveness and adoption into the family of God, which starts in our faith in him, which takes us through this life unshakable and firm, no matter the storms that we face, that takes us on and takes us through and takes us into heaven. See, Jesus um, didn't come and gaze around and look for people worthy of his, of his sacrifice. You know, he didn't see um, people and think those ones are worth saving those ones I would give my life for you know in that incarnation Jesus saw our state that we were lost that we were sheep without a shepherd and he inhabited our world and he offered himself for us now I, I was thinking about this in, in terms of an analogy I don't know if you've ever been to a shelter to rescue a cat or a dog but normally when people go to such places they go there with something in mind. They go there looking for something. They go there um, to make a connection. They go there looking for a good little dog or a good little cat who's had a hard time, who needs some help. But that's not the way God approached the world. God didn't send his son to save the good ones, to save the, save the ones that were worth it. He saw that none were good, Jesus reminds us. None were good. And he came and shared our humanity and as it were, Jesus adopted the mangiest, most useless ones, and that's us. And I know sometimes we don't want to hear that, but we have nothing to offer God, and yet God loves us without reserve, without um, hesitation. The Son of God died for the sake of all of our sins, and it's the truth that we are useless and hopeless, no matter how we might dress it up. In fact, um, it's Jesus, is the one that, only Jesus, who is the one that confers hope on us.
by uh, our expression of faith in him because he replaces the hopelessness of the law. This is one of the things that chapter 10 verses 1 to 18 reminds us of again, that the hopelessness of the law and the way to God and the repetitiveness and the frustration that was felt by our inability to reach God by the work of the priests was replaced by that once and for all sacrifice. You see, see in chapter 10 verses 8 to 10, we see that it was God's will to cut through our inability to come to him by sending the one who would stand in our place, the one who would not be destroyed by the sinfulness, uh, um, the stain of sinfulness that you and I struggle with. And, I, and this brings us to our gospel message, our reminder um, from the gospels of what Jesus taught about this too. I want to just say a few words from Matthew chapter nine. I want to bring you to verse two. Just then, verse two says, some people brought a paralyzed man lying on a bed to Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. What a phenomenal moment that is. What a, a moment it is where we see forgiveness flowing down from heaven through the Son of God, where we see the proof and the truth of the incarnation realised in the work of Jesus, that he was making a man whole, um, not just physically, but spiritually. He was bringing him to a place where he could encounter God. And now, the scripture in Matthew 9 goes on to tell us that not all were pleased. See, the scribes are there and they said, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus perceived their thoughts. He was God. He was very God. And he said, why? I know what you're thinking. Why do you think such evil in your hearts? What's easy to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk. But say, you know, you know that the son of man has authority from God. He said to the paralytic, stand up, take your bed and you go home. And the man did exactly that. And the crowds, what did the crowds do? When they saw this, they were filled with awe. They were filled with glory and wonder for God because they saw that God had given authority to bring people out of the wretchedness of humanity and into the wholeness of, um, that God was offering. And it was through the man, Jesus, that this was being done. Well, then Jesus walks along some more and he sees a man, Matthew, sitting at a tax booth, a tax collector. Boo, we say to tax collectors because we know that tax is one of the only two certainties in life, isn't it? And Jesus sees the tax collector and he says, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. And then he was at dinner. And in that place, dinner, there were many tax collectors and there were many sinners. And they came and they sat with Jesus. They sat with his disciples and the Pharisees, the pupils of the scribes were there now. And they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with these sinners? Why is he surrounding himself with such people? When Jesus heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but I come for those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners. Well, as we reflect on these words of Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 18, we conclude with the truth that in Christ, God has made a new covenant with us. It is one in which it comes into our hearts where we're reborn, we're made alive with God. It is the work of the Holy Spirit which uh, then allows us to hear um, God speak. It is the work of the Holy Spirit which through that covenant allows us to read the word. It allows us to recognize the very light of life that Jesus Christ brings in one another, in our brothers and sisters. That's one of the reasons why fellowship is so important to us. Well, as this new year, unfolds. That's what you carry with you. You carry with you the very light of God, the very covenant that the Holy Spirit inscribed on the hearts of all those who trust in Jesus Christ. Because if you know him and you love him, that's what's inside you. That's what our world burdened right now needs to hear. It's what we need to bring to those who are fearful, those who are worrying, those who are afraid of COVID and the struggles and the depression and the uh, hopelessness that is surrounding us at the moment. We need to tell people that there is a way, that Jesus Christ has made a way which is better than the reality that we're in now. That Jesus has opened the way to God to, for all who will receive him. That all who come to Jesus will never be turned away. They will um, not need um, to prove their goodness, but they will receive his goodness. Their state is irrelevant to him. It's uh, what he can do for them, which matters. See, 
Jesus Christ has come to mend the brokenness of our human condition. He's the one that will turn us away from the riots and from the ravings and the need uh, for control and power and um, overcoming that our world is obsessed with. You know, even in the release of our, our um, new vaccine this week, we're told how great it is and how British stuff is best. And I'm like, just grow up. What we need is to recognise that we are one world, one hurting world. And the answer to that hurting world is found in faith in Jesus Christ because he's the one that will make us whole. He is the one who will stop us identifying as those who will be judged for our sins by God, but will be called forever brothers and sisters of the Lord. If you don't know the Lord today, I ask you to reflect on those words, to think about what I've said. And if you do know the Lord, if you know that the Holy Spirit has written the covenant of the Lord in your heart and in your head, think of the hope that you have for the world and find a way to turn it to someone and bring it to them and shine the light of the gospel and the goodness of God on them today. Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord shine his face on you and he give you purpose and hope in these days. Amen. And we just say, Lord Jesus, come to us. Enable us. Give us uh, the overcoming of fear. Give us help in our struggles and our fears and our worries. Help us to know that you have overcome everything and that we can trust in you. Amen. Amen.